that being said, let's, uh, let's get into the word, um, into the message, and I'm just going to start off with uh, some of the things that, that my mom taught me. My mom taught me religion. When I spilled grape juice on the carpet, she instructed, you better pray, the stain will come out of that carpet. <laughs> my mom taught me logic from the, her decisive words, because I said so, that's why. My mom taught me foresight, make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. You never know. My mom taught me irony, keep laughing, and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> my mom taught me about stamina. You'll sit there till all that spinach is finished. My mom taught me about the weather. It looks as if a tornado swept through your room. My mom taught me the circle of life. I brought you in. I love this one because I, I do say it. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out, right? <laughs> My mom taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. <laughs> and my mom taught me about envy. There are millions of less fortunate children in this world why don't, who don't have a wonderful mom like you do. In all seriousness, if you guys know my mom, this is like not her. This is the exact opposite. My mom is an amazing woman. Um, she has taught me everything that I know, and I owe her everything. She is uh, an inspiration to me. I love her dearly, and I, I just can't express the words. I, I can't say, like, I'm up here, and I'm, I'm, I'm just in, in, in speechless because of how good you are. You are the perfect example of a mom to me, and God knew exactly who I needed to be my mother, and that was you. So thank you, and I love you. That being said, let's pray. Let's, let's stand up. Let's, um, let's get our blood flowing. I want everybody to do 10 jumping jacks. Happy Mother's Day. No. Um, Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be up here, Lord, and just share your word, God. And I pray that this word will resonate with everybody here, Lord, not just moms, Lord, not just grandmas, not just um, spiritual moms, Lord, but everybody, that everybody will get a piece of this word in their hearts, God, and take it with them wherever they go. Father, we praise you, God. I ask that you use me, Lord, to deliver your words, God. This is not me. This is all you, God, and I give you all the glory. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we're going to, yes, it's a Mother's Day message, but um, I'm going to talk, I'm gonna touch on every aspect of life, I think, hopefully. Because it's really hard putting a Mother's Day message as a father together. Um, because, I, like I said before, I just... Some of the things you do are unexplainable. Like, I look at my wife, and I'm like, how do you do that? Where does your strength come from? Because I want some of that. Obviously, we know it comes from God, but I want some of that. Um, so we're going to start off with talking about kids. The, uh, first, the title of the message today is The Heartbeat of a Family. The Heartbeat of a Family. What we need to know about children. What we need to know about children. I actually preached um, last year, Father's Day. Um, in El Salvador, and I gave this little, um, kind of these little outlines here to the fathers in El Salvador in Spanish. Oh, that was great. That was really hard. But I, I altered it a little bit, and um, these are some of the things that we need to know about our children. So to those of you that have young children, you all are raising world changers. World changers. You've got to look at it that way. You've got to look at your kids as if, as if the, the, well, the Lord put them into this world for a reason. They're not an accident. Um, they weren't put here just to sit down and occupy a chair or just to be part of the family. The Lord put them in here for a purpose. The Lord put them in here for a reason. Look at your kids that way. They have a calling. The Lord has a plan for their life. Um, so just look at your kids that way. Everybody, look at your kids that way. And, and just see that inside of them. Know that your children will one day be the future leaders of this world, even the future leaders of this country. And we, as men and women, as fathers and mothers, we have to do everything possible to make them the men and women who will always serve the Lord. That is our, our, our greatest calling, to teach these kids, teach our children, so they can continue to serve the Lord. Because we know that when they get at a, at a more influential age, college years, there's going to be a lot of influence in there. So we have to prepare our children to be able to face 
those obstacles, to be able to face those circumstances. That's a, that's a big calling. But I know that everybody in here can do it because everybody knows the Lord in here. Amen? All right. You're raising up rewards from the Lord. Psalm 127, verse 3 says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Let me ask, how many of you have received a reward, a plaque, um, a trophy? Raise your hand. Almost everybody has their hand. They've received some sort of reward in, in, in their life. Where is that reward right now? On a shelf? Yeah, but you can see it. Is it on your desk? Somebody said desk, it's on your desk. Um, the point that I'm trying to say is you display that reward. You show off that reward. So whoever comes into your house or in your office will see that and be like, hey, that's really cool. So your children are a reward, right? The Lord is telling us to show them off. The Lord is telling them to display them, show them off, be proud of what they've done. I love that. I, I absolutely love that because in our culture, it's, I think we see it as something that maybe we shouldn't do it because we don't want to upset anybody else. Maybe because, you know, their life is different than ours. But the Bible's clear. Our children are a reward. Let's show off that reward. Amen? What do you do with a reward? I mean, does anybody let those rewards, I mean, do they really get dusty? You let, leave them on the shelf, maybe, but eventually you'll come back and dust it off. But typically when you have a reward on your desk, you're going to take care of that reward. You're going to polish it if it's something you're really proud of. You're going to dust it off if it's something you're really proud of. You're going to keep it clean. That's what we got to do with our kids. We got to we got to keep them clean. And that's a tough calling. <laughs> we got to keep them clean. We got to polish them, right? We got to polish them. We've got to show them the word of God. We've got to speak to them as loving parents. We, we have to show them who they are and who the Lord created them to be. We have to do those things with our kids. We have to, we have to talk about our kids. We have to show them off. So don't be afraid when you go to work one day or even in here in, in church, brag. You, you never hear that. I don't think you'll ever hear that up here, but brag about your kids. Brag about your kids. I can brag publicly right now about them right now, but I don't think they would want me to. But my kids are awesome. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> my kids are great. My kids are great. They're, they are uh, truly amazing children, and, and I'm blessed to have them. So, guys, I love you. Two right here, two over there. I love you all very much. Um, talk about your kids. It's okay. It may, it may feel like, you know, a little bit uneasy, but you'll get used to it. The more you do it, the better it is, right? The other thing we have to know about our children is that we have, this is the hardest one for me, but we have very little time with them. Proverbs 20, 22, 6 says, direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. We have maybe 18, 22, maybe more, depending on on family, we have a, a fraction of their life. What is that, a, a fifth maybe of their life, or a fourth of their life um, that we get to train up our children, that we get to instruct them, that we get to show them the ways of the Lord. That's not a lot of time. That's really not a lot of time. To be effective, we have to be present in their lives. We have to be present in their lives. We also have to be intentional. And I know life throws so many things at us. I know there's a whole lot of hurdles and obstacles. Um, I know that, that there's um, so many things going on, especially in our culture, where we get so easily distracted. But I urge you guys, put those distractions aside and be intentional with your kids. Show them how much you love them. Show them how much you want to go out there and, and play with them or throw the ball with them. Show them. They, that's what they want, right? Is this a good Mother's Day message? It's quiet. Man. I'm just being real. That's what the word says. The next thing um, that we need to know about our children is you can't raise children on your own strength. You cannot raise children on your own strength. Philippians 4.13 says, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Who gives you strength? Who gives you strength? 
Christ? Have you tried to raise your kids on your own strength? Maybe. Yeah, it, it doesn't work. It's really hard. It makes the, the task a whole lot harder. Um, it's difficult to raise our children without the Lord. You know, we live in a world that is always trying to separate parent from family. Everywhere on TV, even on, on Disney, there's no, there's no uh, family unit that you see on Disney. It's always mother or father, never together. Um, but everything you see on Disney is, is counter Christianity. Not just Disney, I, I just threw that out there. But everything you see on, t- on, on TV is counter Christianity. It's what the enemy wants. He wants us to be separated from our families. He wants us to be separated from our kids. Um, And the enemy is doing a really good job at that. But why is it that the enemy can win? It's because we're not putting our faith in Jesus Christ. So as Christians, as as Bible believers, as, as people who trust in the word of God, we have to put our strength in the Lord. We have to ask God to come in and, and Lord, do this because I cannot do it. I can't do this on my own. I can't raise my kids. My wife and I can't raise our kids on our own. It's just not going to work out. So trust in the Lord um, to give you all the strength that you need to raise your children. And the last thing that you need to know, know about your children, I'm sure there's many more. And the last one I have here is children want your love. John 4, 1 John 4, 7 says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. Children want your love. Elijah, do you want my love? Yeah. Michaela, do you want my love? There you go. There you go, from the mouth of a babe, right? Okay, not really a babe. <laughs> there you go. But children absolutely want and need your love. Because if you don't give it to them, they're going to get it from somewhere else. And that other source is not going to be a great source. So fill them with your love. Just surround them with your love. Hug them. Give them a giant hug. You know, just, just go up to them. Run up to them and give them a hug. Give them a kiss. Um, but show them your love in whatever way you show your love. Love your children. Love your children the way that Christ loved the church. It applies to that as well. So those those are some of the things we need to know about our children. Um, I think every family has some different things that they have that maybe you can add to this list. I urge you guys to go ahead and do that. Um, Now I'm going to talk about some motherly figures in the Bible. So this should serve as a little bit of encouragement uh, to all the moms in here. The first one we're going to talk about is Eve. Eve, a mother's reliance on God. Eve, the first wife, the first mom, um, can you imagine the first time she gave birth? Can you imagine that? Never having experienced that, never having secondhand knowledge of that, can you imagine the first time she gave birth? I know that obviously God was with her and um, helped her through that, but imagine being the first woman to give birth. There's a whole lot to that. There's a whole lot said in that. The the mother of all of creation, Eve. You know, um, a lot of times, well, for first-time moms here, maybe you guys can relate to that. For the maybe the first time you guys had a kid, the first time you gave birth, what did you experience? You know, you have had maybe had uh, firsthand, maybe had secondhand knowledge of it, um, but she did not. So. You know, just think of what she went through. And she did it because she, well, she was told to do so, but she did it because she loved God. And she knew that through this, all of creation was going to come. So nothing stopped her from, from doing that. Then we have, um, I'm going to butcher this name, but Joshebed. Who knows Joshebed? It's, not, it's a very unheard of name, but mother of Moses. Mother of Moses, Joshebed. Exodus 2, 2 through 3 says this. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of, made of papyrus and reeds 
and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile River. Um, this was an incredible show of love. So she's the mother. It, it, this is a mother's love. I mean, just imagine having to let your baby go because, well, in this case, his life was at stake. Um, but she knew she needed to do something with Moses, and she let him go. And eventually Moses was raised by Pharaoh, uh, by Pharaoh's family. So I, I can't imagine the amount of love that she had for her baby to be able to release her baby to someone else. I can't, ima- I can't fathom that kind of love. But she knew that there was something better for Moses. She knew that Moses didn't have a chance under her care, so she had to let him go under somebody else's care. What an incredible show of love. Maybe some of you have had to do something like that, where you've had to release your baby because you knew that the baby would have been in better hands. That is an incredible show of love. I know that's really, really hard to say, but I respect you highly for doing so, if anybody here can, can resonate with that. Um, the next person, Mary. I'm going to read this whole pericope here, Luke 1, 26 through 38, um, because it's all really good. So let's just go for it. Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to a married man, engaged to be married. (laughs) She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. I just changed the entire Bible. (laughs) She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He'll be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestors, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she conceived, she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am, your, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. That takes an incredible amount of trust. So we, I call her, this is called a mother's trust. I mean, what an incredible amount of faith, incredible amount of trust. Didn't even question the angel other than saying, how can this be for I am a virgin? Simply talking of what she knew. But then she goes on and says, I am your servant. I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. What an incredible amount of trust she had in God in that, right? Um, I mean, just imagine. An angel comes to you and says, you're going to have a baby. An unmarried, unwed woman, a virgin, an angel comes to you and says, you're going to have a baby. I mean, what are you going to do? You're crazy, right? You're crazy. That's insane. That's impossible. I don't believe it. But Mary, Mary knew. Mary knew. So we have to trust in the Lord that he knows exactly what he's doing with our kids. He knows exactly what he's doing in your life. He knows exactly what he's given you. Um, He knows exactly what you will have one day. You have to trust in the Lord. He's going to take care of you. Amen? A mother's influence. So this is also just a little... Little snippet in the Word of God, Lois and Eunice. Anybody know those names? Yeah, Timothy's mother and grandmother. 2 Timothy 1.5 says, I remember your genuine faith, 
For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 15 goes on and says, But you must remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught by the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from trusting in Jesus Christ. I mean, we're talking about Timothy's mother and grandmother. They're mentioned here briefly um, as Paul's talking, and it just goes to show you the generational influence. The generational influence that these, that these two people had on Timothy. I mean, it is, it is quite amazing that they're mentioned here because nowhere in the Bible is it really mentioned generationally uh, of other people influencing others, you know, like this. But um, Lois and Eunice left, left a mark on Timothy. And um, you guys are the same way. Generational influence. What you do right now with your children, I mean, think about it. You're teaching them how to raise kids later on. You're teaching them that the word of God comes first. So when they go to raise their family, hopefully they'll learn those things. They've learned them from you. That's generational influence. I mean, that's a big deal. What you do now is going to affect generations to come. How you raise your children is going to affect generations to come. It doesn't just end with me. It doesn't just end with Christina when we pass away. No, it's going to continue on and on. That legacy will continue. So realize what you are doing in your children's life. How are you raising them? You know, how are you showing them love? All of that is going to affect them in the future. So don't stop. You know, don't, you know, my word of encouragement there is don't stop doing what you're doing. Continue to love them and praise them. Continue to share the word of God with them. Continue to give them truth. Continue to discipline them. It's needed. Um, continue to do all of those things so that way they can, be, they can be good stewards of what you've taught them. A mother's influence. The next one we have is a mother's joy. We have Sarah, Isaac's mother, Abraham's wife. Genesis uh, 21, 6 through 7 says, And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this uh, will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. How old was Sarah when she had her first baby? I hear it. Somebody said it. 90. She was 90. She was 90 years old. She was barren. And the Lord said, you're going to have a baby at 90 years old. So, be patient. (laughs) Be patient. Just wait on the Lord. But this can resonate with some of you because maybe you've had a hard time. Uh, Maybe you haven't been able, um, you weren't, you didn't have that opportunity to have a child. Um, But you know what? Be, Be patient. Wait on the Lord. Amen? I mean, some of us have gone through some really tough times. Um, you know, we've gone through a, a few miscarriages, but we waited on the Lord, and the Lord provided. Amen? So there's hope. All right? There is hope. There's absolute hope. Um, the next one, and the final one that I have here is can't leave her out. A mother's selflessness. Who are we talking about? I'm running this like firehouse style. (laughs) (laughs) Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law. Ruth, uh, Ruth one, she uh, basically in Ruth one, she she lost her husband, she lost her two sons, and then she urged her daughters-in-law, daughter-in-laws, however you say that, uh, her two daughters-in-law, who she loved like daughters, to go to their mother's house. But Ruth decided to stay uh, with Naomi. So on Ruth 3.1, one one day Naomi said to Ruth, my daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. I mean, this is just an incredible sign of selflessness. She lost everything she had other than her daughter's-in-law. And um, 
and then she's willing to let this one go. She's trying to find a husband for Ruth, and she does so. Um, but Naomi treated her kids, her daughters-in-law, as her own children. So for those of you who may not have children in here right now, or maybe they've gone off, uh, they're older, um, but you have children. You have children. You have spiritual children. You have, maybe you have daughters-in-law. Um, but there's, there has to be someone in your life that you can treat as a daughter. And I think Naomi did this absolutely amazingly. I mean, she was an, an amazing figure in the Bible of how to be selfless. So look around you. You know, look around you. Who can you share the word of God with? Who can you disciple? Look around you. There's, there's someone there. The Lord will provide. The next uh, part of this message is, I'm calling it the three R's. Roles, responsibilities, and rules. <laughs> this was a hard one because I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and start giving roles and responsibilities for, for wives. That's not what this is about. <laughs> um, because, you know, today is Mother's Day, so whatever roles and responsibilities you have, hopefully you're relieved of them. Maybe. <laughs> but, but this is actually really important um, because the Bible's very, very clear about different roles, different roles of, of men, different roles of women. Um, so, I mean, imagine. Imagine this. Imagine if a man were to give birth. <laughs> you can't imagine that. All I know is if I were to give birth, I'd probably knock this building down. Because women are created differently. Women can handle pain. I cannot handle pain at all. Um, but, I mean, just when I get nauseous and it comes time not to get detailed, but I, uh, I mean, the neighbors can hear me. <laughs> Sorry for the extreme detail there. Um, but just imagine that. I mean, the Lord knew exactly what he was doing when he created men and women, and he knew that. Women were going to be the ones to give birth. Women were going to be the, the caretakers of the family. Men were going to be the laborers. Um, but I, I just find it fascinating how he created each of us differently. We're all created in his image, but he created us differently because he knew exactly um, what this world needed in order to operate. So, I mean, the other day, Ezra was, was here. It was Wednesday, and um, he, was, he found a hammer somewhere in the back, and I just let him run around with it. You know, why not? Right, guys, why not? <laughs> but it took my wife to say, do you think that's okay? I mean, that's probably not safe. See, if men were running, if men were the ones to, to be the caretakers and, and all that, and I'm not saying that they're not because there are men out here that do that, but, it, but women have this, this sense of, I don't know, what do you call it, this instinct. There you go, this instinct. I, I don't. Wisdom, grace, common sense. <laughs> yep. You know, I lack a lot of that. And, you know, I love it when Ezra runs around with hammers and, and, and uh, drill bits and so <laughs> um, But, you know, women have this grace for that. And, and it just took Christina to point that out to me to be like, that's not, that's not right. <laughs> but roles versus responsibilities, because there is a clear distinction um, between the two. So according to Indeed.com, I love the way they put it, roles refer to one's position on a team. Roles do not vary. You're a mother, you're a father, you're a husband, you're a child. Okay? I'm a father, I'm not a wife, I'm not a, a woman, I'm, I'm a man. Roles do not vary. Responsibilities refer to the tasks and duties of their particular role or job description. Responsibilities vary from family to family. So you may have a different responsibility in your family than I would in my family. And then there's rules, the three R's, roles, responsibilities, and rules. Rules, the Cambridge Dictionary defines rules as an accepted principle or instruction that states the way things are or should be done and tells you what are allowed, what and tells you what is allowed or what is not allowed to be done. So rules are set things, and we get our rules from the word of God, right? 
All right. Rules for mothers. <laughs> Got to dig that really tight. Rules for mothers. I'll, I'll be very, very nice. <laughs> Titus 2, 4 through 5 says, These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. This is like a two for one. This is a two for one. Older women must train the younger women. So if you're an older person in this, in this house, your job, your responsibility is to train and instruct the younger women. Amen? All right. And if you're a younger woman, you must love um, your husband and your children. Right? It's clear. It's outlined in the Bible. If you're a young, I'm, I'm, that's not, those aren't my words. Talk, you know, talk to Titus. Um, <laughs> Uh, and here's, here's what I find really fascinating about this, because the Bible talks about three to four different types of love, agape, phileos, um, uh, what are the other two? Eros and uh, one other one. <laughs> so the, the love we're talking, and we all know that agape love is what? Unconditional love. It's the love that Jesus Christ has for us. It's the love that, you know, we have for, for our family, for my wife, for my kids. This is agape, unconditional type of love. But the love that's mentioned here in Titus is, uh, is actually phileo. Phileo is actually a brotherly, what's considered a brotherly type of love, okay? Uh, phileo denotes personal attachment and is more a matter of sentiment or feeling. You, did you, you get that? It's a matter of sentiment or feeling. So when, when it's said here, train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. It's not talking about this unconditional type of love. It's talking about train them to love them sentimentally. Train them to show them how much you love them. It is devotion based in the emotions distinguished from agape, which represents devotion based in the will. Stated in another way, phileo is chiefly of the heart, whereas agape is chiefly of the head. I thought that was fascinating because, I mean, I know the moms in here, they, they represent that so well. Heart love. Heart love, right? So love your family. Love your husband. Love your children. Not just with an unconditional love, but also with a heart love. The next one, a mother's love. The next one is... Uh, Sorry, Proverbs 22, 6. I got my notes mixed up here. It says, direct your children in the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. And so one of the, the rules for a mother is to direct their children in the right path. What's that path? The word of God. Direct your children in the word of God. Um, and guys, by the way, men, you are not off duty on this. It still applies, all right? <laughs> This still applies to you. This is, this is a role for everybody. But we have to direct our children on the right path so that way they won't leave it when they're older, when they're in college, when they're influenced by all the evil out there. Um, direct them in the right path. Um, let me give you some. See, I was gentle, right? Right? I could have gone into Proverbs. I could have gone into Proverbs 31, but I did not. That is, that is for you to do at home. Um, <laughs> um, rules for children. You guys aren't off the hook, kids. Let me, let me raise your hand, children. Nobody wants, they don't want to raise their hand. You're still, you're still a kid. You're, you're in my house. You're still a kid. We're all children, right? Rules for children. Commandment 5 says, uh, Exodus 20, 12 says, honor your father and your mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord is giving you. I can't make it any clearer than that. I, I can't change I, that. That's what it says there. Honor your father and your mother. That's it. And I know you guys do. These, these, I'm, I'm looking, I mean, these are my youth in Firehouse, and I know they're honoring. And if they're not, they're going to have to talk to me about it. <laughs> I know that they're honoring their mother. Guys, it is, it is very important that you honor your father and your mother, not because it's a commandment, but because it helps us out. You know, the more you honor your mother and your father, the easier your life is going to be, right? <laughs> All right. And the next one, obey. 
Ephesians 6 1. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Obey your parents. There's going to be times when you don't want to obey them, but obey them because they know more than you, right? They, they have so much more wisdom. And as many times, <laughs> you, you may hear this all the time, but I've been in your shoes. Why are you trying to recreate things? I've been there. Listen to me. I've done it. I have failed. I've done all the things you've done. Just listen to me. <laughs> Obey your parents. All right, husbands. Let's see. Husbands, raise your hand. Here we go. <laughs> All right, husbands. Um, I want you to know, if, if you're just like, just like children, there's no, there's no age limit for children. Okay? You're, you're always a child. You're always a child. And, uh, and just like, you know, husbands, you're always a husband. You're married, you're always a husband. Um, there's, no, there's no age limit. You can't stop being a husband after you've been married for 10 years. Right? <laughs> you can't stop being a husband after you've been married, you're still married for, you know, 20, 30 years. You're still a husband. I love the way, um, uh, for those, uh, the men that did, we did a Bible study several years ago, Wild at Heart. I was looking for Andy. Wild at Heart, remember that? Um, by John Eldridge. And he said, he said something that has stuck out to me to this day. And it's just, men need a woman to rescue. I love that. We need a woman, to, we need a damsel in distress. You know, men need a woman to rescue. Um, rescue your wives. Let your wife be that damsel in distress, right? Why are you looking at me like that? Oh, man. She is going to take this word home. And <laughs> um, your, your, your damsel is right there, right? Love her. Number one, love her. Ephesians 5, 25a says, for husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. This type of love is talking about the agape type of love, this unconditional type of love. Love your wife unconditionally. No matter what happens, no matter what's going on, love your wife unconditionally. Recognize that she is a gift from the Lord. Proverbs 19, 14 says, house and wealth are the inheritance from fathers. But a wise, understanding, and sensible wife is a gift and blessing from the Lord. Christina, you are a gift and a blessing from God. Recognize that your wife is a gift and blessing from the Lord. Enjoy life with her. Ecclesiastes 9.9 says, live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. The wife God gives you is a reward for all your earthly toil. Live happily with the woman you love. Enjoy life with her. Have fun. Laugh. Go out. Go on a vacation. Go take her shopping. Whatever it is, have fun with your life. <laughs> and the last one, the last one, um, that I have here, and uh, which I think is the most important, is praise her. A lot of you know Proverbs 31, right? Who knows Proverbs 31? Let me hear. Do you guys know what Proverbs 31? Raise your hand if you know what a lot of that says. Okay. You know the last verse of Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, 31. This verse was for men. Okay, here it is. Give her the reward she has earned. She should be praised in public for what she has done. That word was for all the husbands that, that read the word of God, right? That word was for all the husbands. Give, and kids, and children, give her the reward she has earned. She should be praised in public for what she has done. Praise her. Praise her, right? Praise her. She wants to hear those words. She needs to hear those words. She needs to hear those words. 
praise her. And what I love here is that it says publicly. Yeah, you can do it behind closed doors. You can do it in your house. There's nothing wrong with that. But it says publicly. We got to praise her publicly. Let, let people know what she is doing, right? So I've asked a few people to um, come up here and, um, and praise their wife or their mother publicly. So that's how we're going to end right now. Um, I'm going to be very sensitive to time, but if you can give me another, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. We have a few people that are going to pray publicly, and then we're going to um, finish with something else. So in no particular order, uh, let's see, Elijah and Michaela. Mom, I love you, and I'm so thankful for everything you do, and I'm thankful because you're perfect for our family, and we couldn't be what we are today without you, obviously. Thank you. Mommy, I love you so much. Um, thank you for raising us and homeschooling us and always wanting the best for us, so I love you. Justin. When you said publicly, she leaned over and was like, I don't know about this. I'm like, you have no idea what's coming. So I, I am thrilled to be able to, able to stand up here and publicly praise you. You have done amazing things for our family. As a licensed architect, you've set that aside, which I know is huge, to step in to raise our family. You've, it's dusty in here. Something wrong with the air conditioning. Um, you have really dedicated yourself to raising our kids, the patience, the love, the dedication, the sacrifice. Words don't do it justice, but I love you, and you do amazing for our family. Mom, I love you so much. Um, thank you for always being a wonderful mother to your kids. Um, I really look up to you a lot. I think I was really blessed to have such a exemplatory version of a woman to be my mother. I think you are so strong, and I love how you are just unashamedly yourself wherever you go. Um, I love everything about you. I think you're so cool, and <laughs> I really do look up to you. I love you so much, and um, yeah. And you make me laugh. You're also like one of the funniest people ever. So um, I'm going to show you that I love you by watching the entire 327 minute runtime of the BBC Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> Mom, it is so easy to publicly praise you because you're an amazing woman. Um, not only from raising my brother and I from a young age um, in the way that we should go, teaching us uh, biblically right from wrong, but also just how to be decent human beings. Um, you are beautiful inside and out. Um, joy is the most perfect name for you because you're full of joy and you're full of love. Um, whether it's through hard circumstances or through smoother times, uh, you really are a Proverbs 31 woman um, and a, a woman of God, uh, easy to publicly praise. Uh, and you've not only affected your own biological children, but you have bonus children who look up to you and even call you mom. Um, and you are just, I'm so thankful for you. And I'm so glad that you're my mom and that you're my friend as well. So thank you, and I love you. Yay. This is so good. Words of encouragement. I mean, this is so powerful. But um, I just want to say that I love my mother. Um, the other day, I think we've all been in a place where we grow up and we're like, especially in your early 20s, you tend to like, coming out of your home, you tend to like focus a lot on, all the things that didn't go right, or, oh, I have to, you know, because I was raised like this. Um, but the other day, I had a really powerful moment. It was a very uh, 
teaching moment for my kids, and they didn't like the way I was going about doing it. And they said, well, why are you saying it like this? And I come out and I say, because I am my mother's daughter, and this is the way it was done, and it was right because I am not a mother of the world, and I ended up great because of her. And I literally said these words, not in the most calmest voice, but I felt, <laughs> you know, I just want to say as moms, we do have to raise our voice. We do have to talk sternly. Um, we love our kids. No one except the Lord loves our kids as much as we do. And the Lord, I tell my kids all the time, the Lord loves you more. And my mom raised her daughters in such a way that was so countercultural, not only to the world, but inside the church. It was, she revolutionized the way she was uh, raising her girls um, in church. She was a, uh, 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 first-generation Christian, which I think that the Lord gives grace to parents as first-generation Christians. You're literally going against everything that you were brought up in and trying to do it so differently. And one of the most powerful things that my mother did, she was obviously not perfect, just like I am not perfect. And I told my kids this the other day, I'm not perfect. But one of the most beautiful things that I got to witness my mom do growing up um, is that she prayed for me. And she would write prayers down. And I remember finding a prayer that she wrote. And as a teen, because we're, we're not smart as teens, we're just not, I was like, oh, she really loves me. <laughs> and of course she loved me. But um, being the Dota head that I was as a teenager, um, I thought she didn't like me. And so, but I just remember thinking how powerful to see this prayer that my mom, I have a mom that prayed for me. Not a lot of get, uh, kids get to say that. I had a mom that prayed for me. Although she didn't always say the right things or she wasn't perfect, but she raised me right. She raised me in the Lord. She took me to church every single Sunday by herself, took three girls, three girls all by herself. And people can't even, as a couple, get to church on a Sunday regularly. It astonishes me. But my mom did that. She did that. She brought me to church, and she prayed for me. And so I'm so, so thankful, and I am very proud to call you my mother. I love you. And last but certainly not least, I'll come to you, Brother Gabriel. Don't give me that. <laughs> Uh, this is going way back now. <laughs> this uh, tall girl here uh, took 18 hours for my wife to deliver. And I was so glad I married a Pentecostal girl because she was going with it and it was getting rough. And boy, she blasted out in tongues and liked to raise that roof. <laughs> and everything changed after that. And then and she came forth. And... She came forth, and here she is. <laughs> She's been a wonderful wife. She's, of course, and she stuck with me, and if you knew what that really meant, you'd understand. But I'm not going to explain it to you. Anyway, uh, later, when Amy got married, she uh, created a wedding dress and six bridesmaids dress and a flower girl dress in one month. She, she constructed them all, and they were all perfect except for a few pins hanging on a few of them right there. <laughs> she was tired, man. One month, she and working a job at the same time. So this is a person that's dedicated uh, unbelievably. You know, it's, it's God in people. God gets in people, and they become super parents. Basically, you become so loving because you got God loving with you. And how can you not love when you got love? <laughs> Keep it on. Keep the mic. Now, uh, this is what we're. This is how we're going to end. I want. Um, let's have everybody stand up. Everybody stand up.